should be called sons and daughters of God. If anyone is wondering, in light of all that transpired, if you're wondering, I want to share today with you that God loves I watch the unfolding things this week. My week started off with the issues around this presidential campaign. On one hand, we have a quintessential politician tremendous notoriety and display of talent and knowledge and experience in Hillary Clinton. On the other hand, we have this outstanding entrepreneur, businessman, some would call a philanthropist, is purely a businessman, Donald Trump. Donald has perhaps one of the best answers to the impoverishment of America in terms of what we're doing with trade and foreign policy. But it seems to be buried in the good old boy system Hillary offers for us an opportunity to see quality education, perhaps legislation that will change some of the evils and the things that have brought about such disunity in America. But I can't get past the fact that uh, she hasn't displayed always to the concerns that you and I and others who have been disenfranchised in America are in need of. But that's how the week began. Before Thursday came, I saw again how the lie I'm reminded as I listen to several trials going on in our country, and it blows my mind that our judicial system cannot find probable cause or reason to convict those who are guilty of murdering. On one hand, I live in this country that calls for justice and equality. But on the other side, my experience has taught me that it's just us and there is no equality for us. I'm looking at the international scene. I can't get around it because I've spent time in foreign countries represent America, and I've taken an oath to defend this Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I've 
taken a, a pledge that I would lay my life down for the rights of those who were citizens of America. But at the same time, I can walk through any mall in this country and have a reasonable amount of currency in my pocket. And just because I happen to be someone of a distinct African-American presence, I can be profiled. I can drive across these United States and I'm getting ready to drive to Kentucky in, in a few days. And I can't tell you that once I get on <coughs> excuse me, 26 <coughs> across over to 40 that I will not be stopped, thank you, by law enforcement. I drive a Mercedes Benz. The first question most officers would ask me is not necessarily can I see your license, registration, and proof of insurance. But the first question that's usually asked of me is whose vehicle is this? It seems to be that because I am a person of color, I can't own certain symbols, certain things that would, would suggest that I have been somewhat successful. They don't ask me whether or not how many degrees I have. They assume I have none. Depending on my response, I could be arrested, I could be shot. If the officer has an attitude, he or she can ask me to get out of my car and other patrol cars will come up and I can watch them dismantle my vehicle looking for drugs even though I have no previous record. Something is wrong. My daughter called me on yesterday and asked, she says, Daddy, you're going to preach tomorrow. How are you going to address this issue? What are you going to say? Then she put it in another way as only she can. Baby girl, Brittany. And what are you going to do about this situation. Well, Britt, I happen to be one person who happens to pastor a church. Daddy, I know who you are. I want to know what are we going to do? What kind of strategy? What are we going to do about this? And I simply said to her, today I'm going to preach God's word. I have no that an ex-military member would take a high-powered gun and turn his sights on law enforcement officers and methodically and systematically take out officers, all of which appear to have been Caucasian. The news media is not talking about the lives of those that law enforcement has taken this week. But everybody's concerned about this man who took out these officers. The problem I'm having with that situation is, is this. Though I know both situations are wrong, Though I know that neither one of them can be justified, I have a different vantage point about that individual who took the weapon because 
I live with post-traumatic stress. And I can somewhat understand what might have happened prior to that. I see a young man who has sworn to defend a country that does not mind taking the lives of persons who look just like me. I've seen individuals who have worn a uniform. And what most people do not realize is one of the most systemic forms of racism one can encounter occurs in this, this, this microcosm that we call the military. I know what it's like to be in the room and, and, and I was responsible for giving briefings and, and aspects of cultural changes and, and, and I know what it's like to be, be considered as less than and I'm teaching a class. Not because I wasn't capable. Not because I was not informed, but just because of the color of my skin. I submit to you that that young man may have said, you know what? It's not worth living. He may have considered death as a meaningful release from the madness. We don't want to look at the whole scene. And I want to say to all of you today, do not allow the propaganda of the mass media to poison your mind to see that there is more going on here than just someone taking a life. Race and the color line is still the number one issue in America. I want to announce today that prepare yourselves to live in an America that may not be anything that you've known before because if the signs are right, violence is coming to America. When you watch the movement of God. Whenever God gets tired of his people not doing what he has called them to do, God has a way of sending violence to shake folk up and to change things. The irony of today is I gave this to Sister Sarah before Dallas. Can they see any signs? We are people of God. We are. We are God's instrument. Jesus says we are the light of the world. He says we are the salt of the earth. He has given to the church the unique ability to transform existence. But the church has failed God miserably. Brittany was born the year that Mr. Falk said to me in American National Bank, downtown Danville, Fred, you may have forgotten who you are because I had successfully 
taken on the legal age system in the state of Virginia that had never hired an African American as a senior attorney at common law. And now I was dealing with our sons so that those children, our children and grandchildren went and got education, got schools and degrees, could come back and find meaningful work. Got new jobs. And then the last Confederate pastor was found. And uh, one of the boys that was at the common law meeting was Oxford. He said, Now, where are you going, boy? Some of the boys now could come by there and talk to the people. And we may just have to light up the cross so you can remember where you are. Ronnie, Mr. Bo, all due respect, please let them, let me see the cross before they light it, and I'll light it from where I stand, and I'll take out everything around the cross in the process. Come to my house if you want to, but I got something for you. Put your hands down. Put your hands down. This is no time to be romanticistic. These are times to take a serious look at where we are. Can they see some signs? Is there any sign of us being who we really are? The eerie question for me is the church has failed, but we've got to stop beating up ourselves as African Americans. If change is coming to America, our white brothers and sisters who claim to know Jesus are going to have to speak out and begin to do something about this. And ask all of you who know anyone who happens to be a good fundamental evangelical Christian that loves Jesus to start praying for him and get real with them. Ask them the question, if you love Jesus, can you afford to allow me to be taken advantage of because I love him too. This afternoon, there's a rally planned for downtown Columbia to ceremoniously raise the Confederate flag once again and to bring it down. So it's time now for us as African Americans to stop fooling ourselves we can't bring about the change necessary in America by ourselves. Doesn't mean for us to sit back and not do what we can, but we've got to realize that it's bigger than us and we need help. And we're gonna need our brothers and sisters who claim to love Jesus who do not look like us. Why? Thank you, I thought you'd never ask this text addresses it. It's time for the world to see some signs that we are who we are. And I'm not talking about us, just black folk, but us as the church universal in America, in this country where we all state in God we trust. Let's see what uh, Mark is saying to us. And after Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman who, from whom he casted out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. Afterwards, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell others, but no one believed them. I want to submit today that nothing can be seen from a house which We've been witnessing to each other. 
we'll never see this miraculous display of God's power as long as our evangelism, our witnessing, our sharing, our teaching, our preaching is in-house. We're just entertaining each other. In fact, one of the problems that has, has really crippled the church is we've gotten so internal until there is no external work being done. But I want to say today that Jesus did not do a whole lot of work inside the church. He did most of his work outside. We sing all these songs and we get happy. We come in here and we have our dancing, our praise, our shouting and all that stuff and we feel good. We get affirmed and we have our celebrations and stuff and we, we pat people on the, on the back and we begin to let them feel as if there's somebody. All of that had a place. The church in America has become a social institution where we just affirm one another instead of seeing that God has called us to equip saints to go and make disciples. All the fanfare. All the pageantry. How many church meetings that I've been in where all we did was argue over money and roles? How many people were we were counting on to do something, but because their name wasn't in the program or somebody had misprinted something about them, they got all bent out of shape. And when you're looking for, you can't find them. What does that have to do with being who we are? You can't get any signs there. Mark gives us this second addendum because Really, the Gospel of Mark ends, it ends where this passage begins. It's almost as if Mark is saying to them, when people took serious what Jesus said, some things happened, and he wants to give us an idea of what happens when folk are serious about discipleship. If you want to see God move, if you want to really experience God, you're not going to experience him up in here. Well, I'm here to tell you. Thank God for church. I look forward to it. I can't wait to get in on Sunday morning. No matter how bad I felt this morning, I, I couldn't wait until I could drag myself out to bed and put on some clothes so I can come and look into y'all's faces and stand up there and sing with the choir. But guess what, brothers and sisters? That's just me getting my praise on. There is some work that has to be done, and it cannot be done in here. These women came back, and Jesus saw these two men on the road to Emmaus. Notice now, when they went back to church and told folk that they had seen Jesus, nobody believed them. You've got a whole lot of folk worshiping God every day, but really don't believe. We really don't believe. And because of our unbelief, we have not experienced We've not come to grips with this thing. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. And we've been anointed to do God's will. Now he changes here. The predicament of stubborn, unbelieving believers. Hear what Mark says. Still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples, the 11 disciples. As they were eating together, he rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief. Do you really believe that you are a son, a daughter of God? Do you really believe? That you are a child of the king. Do you really believe that he has brought you out of darkness and placed you in his marvelous life? Do you really believe that he lives in you and his spirit will empower you? Do you really believe that? 
Jesus himself rebuked, notice now, the disciples. Those who walked with him. Those whom he had blessed. Those whom he had fed. Those he had used to heal. Those he had used to feed. Those he walked among. He rebuked them because of their stubborn unbelief. The church has been cursed by an unbelieving spirit. Unbelievers. I couldn't believe this as I read it. They refused. They refused. They refused. Parenthetically, I want to say to you, when I went to my brother, and said, at the Metro Associates, Bill Deacon, and said, Bill, I got to do something. The verdict of not guilty had been given to so-and-so. His son that he murdered, an innocent child with was given back to him on the court premise. As a bill, something needs to be done. We need to address this issue. It's time for black and white Christians to get together and talk about this. A change needs to come. It wasn't that he didn't believe. It was that he refused. Notice here, it's no lack of knowledge. It's a state of mind. We know right from wrong, but sometimes we refuse to do right because it's more comfortable to live in the wrong. 